great. Morning, everyone. Hi, and w- welcome to the latest um, ESIS podcast. Um, my name's Dan Bowden. I'm an emergency medicine consultant, and I'm a current interim national clinical director for urgent and emergency care, and I'm clinical associate for ESIS. And today I'm joined by, by Prem and Fiona from Frimley, who are going to talk to us about some amazing work they've done on initial assessment of patients within um, urgent and emergency care. Do you want to introduce yourself, guys? Right. Hi. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, my name is uh, Prem Premachandran. I'm one of the a consultant at Primly Park. Um, I'm in Primly now 25 years, so, and I've been a clinical lead for 11 years, uh, but not anymore so as a clinical lead and a consultant. Hi, my name is Fiona Rodney. I'm an emergency department clinical matron, and I've been in this place for over 10 years. Fantastic. And thank you both for taking the time to, to speak today. Um, I guess from my point of view, from a clinical point of view, we we all know that initial assessment is a really kind of vital part of, of uh, from a patient safety perspective, that welcome, that, that make sure there's no life or limb threatening injury, and then ensuring that we give our limited resource to the right patient at the right time. That, that's vital to a well-functioning urgent care system. And, and you at Frimley have done some amazing work in this area, and we wanted to use the next 10 or 15 minutes to talk through some of that work, why you've gone about it, how you've gone about it, some of the learning that you've taken from that work, and then hopefully use this as a resource and an offer for any trust that want to follow this piece of work. I know that you're very happy to to help and support in any way that you can. So is one of you happy just to give a bit of a a bit of a background to um to, to how this bit of work came around and what you've done? Yes, Dan. Um I think pandemic has been really a confusing and worrying time for everyone, you know. Uh, but now every emergency department in the country are facing very challenging time with increasing in demand, crowding, and overstretched and uh, tired workforce. But however, I think we learned quite a lot during pandemic. Okay. So how do we apply some of the learning uh, from the pandemic to a long-term solution? That's what we are looking at which will enable us to deliver safe, effective, compassionate care. So, so we in Frumbly thought, oh, where do we start? I think first thing was good to start in the front door to ED. So what we did was, and also it's extremely important to have a process in place to properly assess everyone attending ED. That's really important. So pre-pandemic, we were using streaming, triage, and initial assessment separately. What we did during pandemic was to combine all, compress all three together, and we call as meaningful initial assessment. So instead of a vertical process, it's a parallel process. That's what we did. And then you ask the question, why it is important? Uh, Fiona, do you want to? So I think for us, it was to make sure that we had a system in place that we could quickly identify the acutely unwell and sick patients um, and to ensure that each patient as they arrived, regardless of the time of day, they had a full meaningful assessment and therefore enable us to deliver the appropriate initial treatments, i.e. analgesia, early access to diagnostics such as radiology, x-ray, CT, appropriate direct referrals to specialities, redirection to external services if appropriate, and that each patient as they arrived in would have that full meaningful assessment and then moved on from the assessment area. Um, And in order to to do that, it would enable us to then to make sure that each of the patient's journey had the right start as they arrived into the emergency department, that was key, and have appropriate communication so we could manage the patient's expectations as they arrived in. So you've arrived in with this and this is what's going to happen. This is what your journey is going to look like. Um, And it was really important that we had the staff on board to ensure that everybody understood why we were doing this. And our message was very simple. It was we want all of our family and relatives to ensure that they had the right treatment as they arrived in the emergency department. And we all know that it's very frustrating if you arrive somewhere and you're sort of just left waiting without any information, lack of communication. So for us, it was about putting the team at the front door. So we had a team of senior nurses that had the appropriate skills to make um, early decision making, access to um, diagnostics, point of care, 
and to ensure that the patient's journey started off correctly as they arrived in. And that obviously has impacts on everything, such as patient flow, appropriate risk assessments for those patients arriving in with mental health needs, learning disabilities needs, managing um, alternative pathways if necessary. And if we got it right as they came in, we found that actually that their journey had improved throughout the entire department. Um, and that was yeah, really and, part of the wise. And also, I think the it, it, as Fiona said, it is really important to understand and do the things very early on their journey. And if you do that, and I think in the patient flow, it's actually much better if you start everything early, because most of the time what happens is patient sit and wait for something to happen, so two, three hours before anything starts. Here, what we have done actually is, as soon as they come into the hospital, any department, whether ambulance or walking, we initiated the, do a meaningful assessment and initiated the treatment almost straight away there. So the pathway actually, it's much easier when the flow to the department. So if everybody knows what are the things we need to do to this patient from the start, I think that was a real uh, important aspect of this process, I think. And during pandemic, other thing is because of the infection control, we could identify who is um, infected, uh, so sorry, strictly divide them into green or uh, red areas. And also if somebody has a neutrophilic sepsis patient walk in, how do we divide, segregate them properly from the early stage rather than somebody wait for that? So I think by doing this actually, we not only having a safety approach to the initial assessment, but also how what are the resources we need to make sure that um, we can expedite the process once they're in the department. That, that, that's a really helpful kind of context, actually. I mean, a couple of things that, that jump out for me. That 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 phrase, meaningful initial assessment, is really important, isn't it? Because we've got, you know, we, we, that meaningful bit is vital for patients. Anyone can do a, a brief cursory initial assessment, but it has to be meaningful. It has to be right for patients. So that that's really important. That that links to the kind of um, you know, getting the right the right person to the right place first time, doesn't it? And making sure that we're minimising waste in the patient journey and getting the patient to the right place. And, and the, my other kind of comment before we move on was around, uh, Fiona mentioned it, and she may, may come back to it again later, but the importance of communication to patients when they arrive, of expectations of what's going to happen, and communication to, to staff of this is the rationale for what we're doing. It's the right thing for patients. It's the right thing if your relative were to come into the emergency department. That kind of hearts and minds piece is really important, isn't it? But my understanding of this, I have, I have talked to you before about this, Prem, is that the, the ESI is, is kind of a vital part of this. Tell us a bit more about, about ESI. Yeah. So ESI is a tool that we've been using now at Brimley for well over 10 years, and it's a, a validated tool for assessment. And I suppose where, from a nursing perspective, it's very easy to use, it's simplistic, it's not complicated, and it breaks down the patient's um, assessment into five categories. So you're either an ESI one, two, three, four, five, and one is life-threatening, and five is needing no resources. So it gives you an, er it's a tool that you can really early recognise the sick patient that number one, life-threatening, that you'll move from the front door directly into the recess room. For example, as a patient walks in and they are a trauma, a patient that's fallen from a horse, significant injuries would be moved straight into the recess room as an ESI one. An ESI two would be a high-risk patient, so a patient that's potentially septic, a potential um, stroke, a potential heart attack, anything that is a high risk that you need to do an assessment to see exactly what's wrong with the patient. An ESI 3 would be a patient that would require multiple resources, including diagnostics like ECG, lab results, speciality referrals. An ESI 4 would be a type of patient that would just need one resource, i.e. minor injury, minor ailment. And an ESI 5 is somebody that's going to need no resources, so potentially could be re-referred back to community services or external services, depending on what's available in your trust. The tool is validated. The staff love it it's easy to use it's not complex um, and for us from the on the front door it was ideal just to keep with this tool that the staff know have regular training on and a, a simple tool to use i think it's esi i think 
so emergency severity index, that's what it's called. As it's been used um, in several other places, it's not just friendly. Um, you know, I'm not saying just only you need to have one system, you can have any system, but the importance, and as Fiona said, ESI is actually is identify the sick people, ESI one and two quickly. So they don't need too many, this one they can go straight into research. And then if they are not sick, then it's identify what are the resources you need to sort out that patient. So it's uh, so in that way, the flow you become much, much uh, uh, easier because you identify for to sort out these patients in our department, what resources we need. Is it radiology? Is it senior review? Um, some other test? So we can identify that in very early then the flow become easy. And also it's identify the four and five are uh, only one resource. Somebody got a wrist injury, need an X-ray, plaster and fracture clinic, or somebody doesn't need any resource, probably is a GP type of problem, you know. And also I think this one, the meaningful assessment doing the ESI, you know, the new way of doing things, how do we transfer people into uh, to an alternative pathway? This by doing this way meaningful, we can actually do it in a much more robust and safety way to move to people rather than just moving people around. And we have we have done this now to pediatric as well, ESI. That works very well with pediatrics as well. So you can have a one system to identify the sicker people and what resources need by doing the same system. And, and that's really helpful because I was going to uh, kind of ask a follow-up question around the, you know, the, the, the benefits of ESI versus Manchester triage, for example. But I think you've... Um, You've elaborated on that on that already around the allocation of resource and around the and then you've, you've kind of expanded a bit around re, around redirection as well. Is there anything else you'd want to add around the, the benefits of ESI against Manchester triage or? I, I, from a nursing perspective, I could just say I found the tool far more simplistic to use than Manchester triage. So from a, it was a quick, easy tool. And also for the staff, when you're teaching it, it is a quick, easy tool to get used to, whereas the Manchester triage does take a long time before you're actually familiar with using the, each each of the pathways. That's that's really helpful. And, and as Prem said at the beginning, it's not this isn't about moving from one tool to another. It's about getting the right the right meaningful initial assessment for patients coming in to get into the right place first time and and, and, and allocate appropriate resource and see them in a timely manner. Um, the, 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 then the bit around the kind of the, the patient and staff experience side of things that that's clearly that's why we do the job isn't it is to make sure that our patients have the best experience they can and that our staff want to come and work you know in our departments and give the best care they can do you want to talk to that talk to that around what you've done yes. with meaningful assessment and how that how that's had an impact on patients and staff so i think the key thing for us was at the beginning when we when we were introducing this we made it very clear this was we were going to do this if we felt it was the right thing for our patients so we were always up to reviews feedback regular meetings is it working is it working you know during the day is it working at night and making sure that we got all staff engaged that cover all shifts to ensure it was working and staff to know that if we felt that this wasn't the right thing for our patients then we would stop and we would re reassess and re-review so um, thankfully, as staff had the opportunities to raise any concerns, to give feedback, to suggest things, they were they felt as though they were on board with this. Um, and we had, you know, quite early on some really positive feedback saying we never want to go back to working in any other way but this new system that we put in. Um, and I suppose for, for us as nurses, it's really important that we are able to deliver good care. And I think we get frustrated when we can't do that, when systems let us down or, um, you know, patients, we've had delays waiting for ECGs or delays to get um, analgesia. And I suppose working in that area and being able to deliver all of that all at the same time gave staff feeling, well, enabled our staff to feel satisfied. And watching the patients, knowing that they were had the proper communication, that they knew what to expect. Again, staff felt really satisfied by that. So, um, in, and ensuring as staff were introduced to the new system that they had the appropriate training and that we ensured that staff were supernumerary when they didn't have the appropriate training, ensuring that we always had senior decision makers available in the assessment team so that nobody felt that they were doing something that they weren't comfortable with and there was always somebody senior to go to. Um, and I think having that staff on board and getting that positive staff feedback had a 
direct positive impact for us in the new system and, and moving it forward. And from the patient's experience, and I touched on it earlier on, Dan, I think it's really important. The most important thing for our patients is communication. You know, safety, they are expecting that when they walk in, they expect to receive safe emergency care. because that's what we're here for. So, um, but for them to actually have that communication as they are with us to ensure that we say to them, look, you've arrived with this and this is what's going to happen ensure that we give them their analgesia as they arrive in the door. You know, if somebody comes in with a, a minor injury, you know, a service that enables you to be a, have a meaningful assessment, offered analgesia and your x-ray ordered as you arrive in, they, they feel straight away valued as they've come through the door. Equally, as some, if somebody comes in that's a high risk patient that has come in with a mental health crisis, to have a meaningful assessment that includes a proper risk assessment with an appropriate referral to mental health services, identified as a high risk patient, rather than sort of left in a waiting room and sitting there, it's such a difference for those patients. And ensuring that, you know, those patients that arrive in with a learning disability, that they realise again that they are considered for us as a high risk patient prioritised, brought straight into the department again, not left in a waiting room on, you know, scared and frightened and not knowing what's going on. Um, we haven't had any formal feedback, but that's going to be part of our future plans is to send out patient surveys to get formal feedback. But the sort of day to day feedback that we've had from the patients that they really feel as though as they arrive in the department, they are listened to. And it's taken that time. And I think sometimes with streaming and doing whatever you can do to try and get the right thing for your service, it just leaves patients feeling as though, well, I haven't actually told my story. Nobody's listened to me as yet. But ensuring you do a meaningful assessment as somebody arrives in for us was key to listen to our patients. I think it's interesting. Last week when I was in ED, one of the senior nurses walked to me and said, Prem, I, don't, I, I think, you know, this system is working really well. I'm really satisfied. I'm doing a good job. Uh, coming through and it was really good to hear from that and then she said Prem it's uh, right patient right time right on the right um, you know the speciality uh, going to the happening that always it's really reassuring that's according to her she was so happy and, and she said I thought Prem I just want to come and let you know that actually is working so it's good to know that staff actually are happy with it because as you know at the moment it's the morale is low and everybody stretched a bit after the pandemic to have something to encourage them and also to support them in a way i think it's very useful that's really really helpful and you know really helpful kind of context and, and really powerful actually to listen to that so thank you both but i guess my final question is around kind of next steps and, and that's either next steps for, for for you and your vision for frimley for the, this piece of work or do you have any thoughts on you, you know next steps on how potentially this really you know really really important piece of work could be um it could be scaled up and be um you know be be be, be used on a wider scale across the across the nhs so either of those would be great to hear your, view, your views and thoughts really i suppose i i suppose one thing to to be really aware of, we're all aware that not every um, new system that people put in place is not going to fit everybody. So, so, so I think that's the first thing that we'd like to say. For us, in our local catchment area, our local community needs, this is working. And that's not to say it would work for everybody. However, I think all of us feel in the NHS that when we do come up with something that has a direct positive impact on our patients and our staff, well, that's worth sharing and that's worth giving people the opportunity to see if it would work for them. So we would be more than happy to welcome anybody that wanted to come and visit to see if, if it is something that they would feel would be benefit in their trust. Um, for us, it's worked. And I suppose going forward, we discussed about, we really want to get some formal feedback from our patients rather than it all being sort of the day-to-day -day stuff. And a challenge will always be ensuring that the staff are appropriately trained and skilled. You know, that's really important that you have those senior decision makers at that front door and then making sure that you do maintain that training, that staff. And as I think every emergency department ensuring that your staffing numbers are correct to be able to deliver this. Mm -hmm. And that will always be an ongoing challenge for us. And ensuring that it continues to be fit for purpose now that we're coming out of the pandemic. So so there, there'll be some of our challenges. I think, you know me, Dan, I think my vision is actually to see how we can help each other uh, we learn quite a lot during the pandemic uh, and sometimes we don't we forget actually how you can 
improve and develop this. I think this is a really good example of one of those. Uh, how do we, what the learning we had to make it into a long term solution? Um, so there may be, so there are more uh, good uh, um, activities going on at the moment and the process uh, changes. So this is one example for people to think how we can do it and how we can help each other. I think that is really important. Uh, how do we make the, our patients safe? And also how do we make our staff morale and the well-being maintained? We are sitting in a well-being room, I think, here. Now, I think it's so, so important to make sure the staff are happy what they're doing. I think these are the things will help to maintain and improve those things. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you both. So um, really, from my point of view, incredibly useful, really kind of, you know, insightful. And, and for me, just just value your taking the time to, to talk through what, you know, what you've done, but, uh, but from a learning point of view. So I, I know that you're happy to share any resources that you've got around um, ESI, around anything that you've found today that can be shared openly and widely through um, through, you know, as, as part of the resources for the ESIS podcast. Um, I'm sure people will be jumping at the chance to come and hear, you know, either to visit or to hear about the work that you've done more directly. I know that you're happy to offer that as well, which is brilliant. Um, for, from my point of view, I think that 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 finishes off the session really. But I just really, again, just to really thank you both for your time. Really, really valuable. And I hope that people listening have, um, have, have found this useful.